Gotta get your brain right if you're trying to make a million dollars. If you ain't gonna do it for yourself, then do it for your mama. Only stay surrounded by them people if you know they solid. Elevate your hustle up today to double up your profit. Trying to learn some game, it's heavy, y'all gonna talk about it. No Deanna, speak that shit that everybody vouching. Ain't no more excuses valid. Get up off the couch and get up in your bag. To your bank account, need an accountant. Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the greatest show on earth, the Millionaire Mindsets Podcast. I am your gracious host, Xavier Miller. And before we start this show, as always, I would like to advise all the guests, the watchers, the viewers to please like, subscribe, leave that five star rating, review, comment, all those things, because y'all know we're trying to run those numbers up to wrap up 2023 and going into 2424. We're trying to really go crazy and run it up, come out with some dope fire content for y'all. So if y'all would do all those things, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. And getting right into the show, so today I got a very special guest, man. He's doing it big in real estate. He's doing his thing. He's, he's coming on the show to provide a lot of value, and I want you guys to get familiar with him, familiar with him, hear his story, take the information in, and his name is Dave Ball, a.k.a. House Rich Dave. Welcome to the show, brother. We're glad to have you here. I hey, appreciate you having me. Happy to be here. Man, so let's get, let's, let's get right into it, man. So for the, for the viewers, for the listeners... <laughs> Who this 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 may be the first time he, hearing of you. You mind just giving a br- brief background on yourself? Yeah, most most definitely. So um, I'll just jump into how I got into the real estate industry. Okay. So I was 29, and I was actually in the process of buying a home, me and my wife. It was actually the property we were talking about before this before this uh, episode. And it's actually, you know, it actually was my fiance at the time. And so like two weeks before we're ready to move into the house, we got a call from the lender. Hey, your mortgage is denied. And so very stressful time frame, but it was also like six weeks before I was even set to get married. Like probably two of the most stressful things you can do in life, get married, get married and, and, and buy, a house. buy a house. And so the crazy thing about it was I was so ignorant about the home buying process. I didn't really understand how stressed out I should truly be, right? Because I didn't understand I was going to lose earnest money, which was like probably like four or $5,000. I didn't even understand I could lose the property. I was just like, hey, why don't the, the seller just, why don't they just move back the date and help, and you know, move back the date to uh, help me out. And so the, the craziest part about that is this is actually the third home I purchased before. So I was actually on my third home and I had no clue how the home buying process worked still. Like my first home, I actually house hacked that property without my roommate even, even knowing it. <laughs> my, my second home, um, I purchased um, a home that eventually had turned into a rental. So you would think, you know, two homes, I would know what I'm doing. But I realized I had no idea about the home buying process. And the, the craziest even thing about this is because I, I knew, because I realized I'd purchased multiple homes and still didn't understand the home buying process, I was in the process of becoming a lender at that point. Because I was like, hey, you know, you bought multiple homes. Do you really like real estate? You understand like financing? Why don't you get into the mortgage industry so you can actually teach people and they can understand what they're doing, not just not just pushing papers. And so I was actually working for a mortgage company at the time my loan was denied. I've been in the industry for only like three months at that time frame. I mean, it was actually like the company I worked for that actually declined my mortgage. Despite the fact that I talked, they knew my financing, I talked to them about the whole process, the, but the own company I worked for denied my loan. Why? They, they said there was an issue with the, with the income. So like the first year that I was working for the company, they were just like, hey, you're on a, you're on a base income because you know, it's, it's full commission. But for whatever reason, even though they told me that they denied my loan because they were like, your income, we don't have any guarantee the income will continue. Okay. And which th- they should have known that because I work. Know, right, yeah, I work. For, I work for. The, I understand another company, but I work for the company. So I was like, man, I'm just really a number at this point. And so at that point, I was just like, hey, I'm going to get into these mortgage guidelines. I'm going to make sure I understand the process better than better than the lenders, better than anybody out there. And so uh, that's not really started my my journey of kind of like diving like deep into the concept and, and teaching folks how to buy a home. Because so I was like, what happened to me? I don't want that to happen to anybody else. Getting your loan declined two weeks before you move in with your fiance six weeks before your wedding, just, just a horrible experience. So I was like, I gotta. No, but th- th- this is interesting. So you said you was gonna lose earnest money. So why would you lose earnest money? Cause the, the, they denied them. Yeah, yeah. so how, how, how the process works is like when you purchase a home, typically you gotta give, there's like four times you give money within like the first week of the home. Like you gotta give money to the, to the lender for the appraisal, if they can order appraisal with your, um, with your loan. You got to put down earnest money because that's your skin in the game as yep. a home buyer, right? And so, typically it's like one percent of the purchase price, and then you have like your 
Um, option period, we have a time to inspect the property. You gotta pay option money, and then you, you pay for an inspector as well if you wanna get the home inspected. You should definitely get the home inspected. And so, when you're buying a new construction home, typically you can get the earnest money back if your loan is denied. But when you're buying like a new construction home, builders just have their own set of rules, right? And so I'd already passed the, um, the option money period, like that seven month window, because like two, two weeks before closing, pretty much everything should be wrapped up or close to wrapped up at that point. Um, but um, yeah, since we had already passed that window, like they're at the point where they could just, the builder could just keep the earnest money because I'd already, I had already passed that, that option money window. And so th that's why I could have lost like that earnest money in that, that scenario. Mm, that's a little, damn, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's interesting. Something, yeah. I want to go back for a second too. You talked about your first home, you own living with a roommate, and yeah. your roommate didn't even know. So break that down for the listeners. Like how, how do you have a roommate that don't know you own the property? So yeah, so um, to well, I get that, I want to may go on a little quick, quick tangent real quick because okay. I think I think one of the the interesting things about this story is that um, like buying real estate can really accelerate your your wealth building journey. So like one of the things I often see online, I'll see like finance pros and gals, and they'll be like, hey. You don't need to own real estate to build wealth, which is 100% true, right? But um, they often, they'll, they'll do this pitch where they're like, hey, um, a matter of fact, you know, don't let anybody shame you to not own it, to being a renter. They'll go through this whole spiel and I'm like, okay, why, 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 you, gotta, why you gotta do all that? And then, uh, <laughs> and then, so, and then so typically they'll, they'll give a couple examples. They'll be like, well, I know these people, um, they'll give like four people. I know four people that have been lifelong renters and they built a whole bunch of wealth. And so I'm like a nosy person. So typically I'll click on the profile and see what this person is about. And so what, what do you think like the common thread is typically amongst these these lifelong renters that are able to build like a bunch of wealth? What, what would you think the common- the Lifelong renters? That are that are actually able to build like a bunch of wealth. Like what do you think the common thread is amongst amongst these people? Uh, business owners for one, they- um... yeah, yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's, yeah, so- No, but, but I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking they probably in a position where something with their business is attached to them convincing people to not own so 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 yeah pr pr pretty much so typically like i say the common thread is like i'll, I'll click on the page and it'll be like uh, i'll look at somebody so typically like the finance folks they'll at some point they'll break down like the, the what they make per month and so like i i know i run the numbers and i'll be like okay it's like oh you know jenny she works in uh phoenix and she makes like nine thousand eight hundred ten dollars after tax so i'm like Okay, she and then it's like, oh, she makes another five thousand dollars selling selling courses. So I was like, okay, and I always think like the reason that this person was able to build wealth is because they make a lot of money in their their business or their W two job. It's not because they're renting; it's because they make a lot of money like outside oh, yeah, yeah. of, okay, of, of the business, mean. right? Yeah. So, um, I, I tell them to say like the 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 common thread is you probably don't know. I would say anybody that either doesn't make close to six figures or owns real estate that isn't like well off. I, I, I just don't think that person exists. Typically, if you want to be well off, you know, retire early, you got to typically have some sort of like high high earner, or you have to own real estate. Like real estate is that that great accelerator, right? And so, I tell a story to say that, um, like I know you've had a guest on here, like Andre. You know, he famously tells you folks that he made twenty six thousand dollars a year before he he got into real estate. Mm -hmm. And like my example. Um, by the time I got out of the Navy, I had a net worth of like $106,000, like in my bank account at 25, because I owned real estate. I didn't, I didn't make a bunch of money in the, in the Navy. So like how I got into that was my, my environment. Like a very important thing was me growing up, like I never lived in an apartment before. And so when I got out, when I graduated college, I was like, okay, it's time to buy a house. That just makes sense. I've always lived in a home. I, everyone just lives in homes. Like that's what makes sense to me. And so, the advantage I had was my parents that owned real estate. So I was able to talk to my parents and be like, hey, like, how do I, how do I buy a house? They're, and they kind of kind of walked me through the home buying process and, you know, what you had to do. And they're like, you know, look at the property. And some of the things that I knew I wanted in a property was one, I know I never wanted to cut grass. It just I remember as a kid, like every house we owned just had a hill. And I just remember putting that, putting that out, that lawnmower up the hill. And I, was, I never wanted to do that. And I was like, I was in the military at the time too. And so I was like, I need a place that I can, that can be secure. I need a place that I can be gone for six months at a time, three week trips, and that I don't have to basically be there. Folks won't, folks won't know I'm gone. So I'm like, okay, I want to get like a, a condo or a town or something like that. And so I was talking to my, my parents about that and they were like, hey, have you ever thought about getting a roommate? And I was like, not, not really, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, you know I'm, out, I'm out of college, I'm independent, you know, why would I want to have a roommate? Where they were like, hey, you can actually have your roommate contribute to a portion 
of the rent. And I was like, oh, I never, I never thought about that. And so they were like, you know, you probably, probably should get a property that's maybe, you know, two, two or three bedrooms. So I was like, oh, that's going to be a little bit more than I was looking at, looking at, you know, one bed, one bedroom condos. So they were like, well, if you have an issue paying the rents or you, you can't get a roommate, they were like, hey, we can help you out with the mortgage. Like, I always leave that part in the story because sometimes people are, are taken back. They're like, well, you have an advantage because you had a parent that would potentially help you with the mortgage if you couldn't find a roommate. And I'm like, well, one, just buy a home within your budget if you don't have a parent that, that does that. Then two, I'm like, hey, well, you work on being the parent you, to the kid that, and do that down the future. Because, you know, everyone likes to talk, you know, generational wealth, but they don't want to look down the future and take generational actions in that, in that, in that case. And so my um, eventually end up getting the home. And so my parents were like, no, you're both, um, you're both 20. I found a roommate. So like, hey, you're both 20. You're both young guys. We don't want there to be like any, any conflict in the property. Like we don't want it to be a situation where he thinks, hey, you're both the same age. They don't have to pay rent. You don't have to be arguing about rent with the roommate or fix this and that. So they're like, hey, just, just let us be the property manager. So essentially for the, the entire five year time frame, he paid rent to my folks. They put it in my bank account. When there was an issue, and he, and I, I, I truly don't know if he knew my parents even owned the property. He just knew they were sending money to somewhere else. And so if there was an issue, he would let them know. They would call me. I would fix the issue. That, that went on for, for five years. It helped me get off to a great financial start in life because essentially my living expense for five straight years was, was $500. Um, and so I was able to keep that money. I was able to invest. And by the time I got out the, the military at 25, um, I had $106,000 in my, in my bank account to my name, just based on um, just house hacking that, that single family property for, for five oh, years. Five so years. yeah, so folks think you, you always need a multifamily property to house hack, but uh, yeah, same roommate, five years. Um, had a living expense of about $500 for five short years. That's definitely accelerated, I'll tell you that. And mm -hmm. also, I think that's a big, um, that's a big lesson for, to the, everybody that's listening because oftentimes, it's gonna be people that's listening and watching this and they got roommates yeah. that they, the roommate directly knows they're the owner of the property and they yeah. probably going through hell. So that's a good strategy for the people that's listening that do have roommates where you can you can position it where they don't know that you're the owner of the property, yeah. whether it's whether they got parents or siblings or a friend, you could put different people in position mm -hmm. that is the property manager and they could pay them your roommate could be, a, I have no idea what's really going on. I yeah. think that's a dope way because, like you said, at the reality of it is, when you got young people living in the house, issues can occur. Yeah, yeah. And then now somebody don't want to pay rent. They think because y'all peers, it's like yeah. I can slide by with things. Mm -hmm. it, it can get kind of fishy. So that's definitely a, a, a good way. I think that's a great nugget, bro. That's a yeah. great, great helpful nugget, man. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I want to talk about so. You what are, what are, what are the because this is I've seen you speak on this before. What are the biggest mistakes, from your opinion, things you've seen, heard, that people make when it comes to buying a home? Yes, yeah, so I'd say some of the, the top mistakes folks make is, is one, and this is coming from a, a realtor, is one, folks talk to a realtor like way too early in the process. So what do like, you mean? So like I have this, um, this eight step home buying process I like to tell folks, because they always come to me too early. And like a realtor is step number eight. And so realtors are, are knowledgeable about the home buying process. But here's the thing, like your, your, first, well, your first step in buying a home is just believing you can, as corny as it sounds. But like number two is like you need to establish like your own goals and like why you want to buy this home. Like is it is it because, you know, you saw some guy on Instagram say you should buy a home. It's because you're trying to, you know, build generation wealth. You need to truly establish like why you want to own a home in the first place because ownership isn't isn't for everybody, right? And so you need to establish your goals, which helps set up like your portfolio. And so a realtor can't help you establish your goals. Your, your friend in the break room at work, they can't help you establish your goals. Like you need to really truly understand like why you want to buy a home. That's got nothing to do with the realtor. Um, next is like, you got to establish truly a budget. And so like one of the biggest mistakes I see home buyers make is they don't truly know how to establish a budget when it comes to, to buying a home. So I'm, I'm going to kind of ask you, this question. So if I, if I were to ask you, like, uh, I'm not going to ask you a specific question, but you can just think of the answer in your head because maybe this is a little bit personal. Right. But if you're looking to buy a home, just think in your head, like uh, y'all out there too, like what would your budget be when it comes to buying a home? You probably got a number, number in your head. Yeah, yeah. So is it, is it, is it above or below a hundred thousand dollars? Above. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody said a number yeah. over a hundred thousand dollars in here. And so that, that's the issue I think most people have is because when I talk about a budget for buying a home, 
I'm thinking of a monthly payment. What happens is a lot of folks, when they, want to, when they go to buy a home, they think, hey, they think home price first. And here's the issue with that. Once you talk about a home price, you've already probably at this point, you're like, hey, I want a $400,000 home. You've probably already gone to Zillow. You're looking at the na- neighborhoods of $400,000 right. homes. You're looking at the pools. You're looking at the countertops. You're looking at the, the, the golf course nearby. You're looking at the businesses. You've already mentally moved into at least a $400,000 neighborhood, right? So, and I, I knew this is back when I was a lender. So when folks would come to me, they would have, they would always have this number in mind as far as like the home price. And so I'd be like, okay, that's great. Then I, I would always ask them like, what do you think the monthly payment is on that property? And just Kanye, no shrug, Kanye shrug, right? Like no, no, no one would ever know. And the issue with that is you'll end up talking yourself into a, a home you can't necessarily afford. Like if I had asked you before you had done the whole, the whole Zillow search and all this, you may have said twenty five hundred dollars, yep. but now you've already you've already mentally moved into this four hundred thousand dollar home, and so the budget, the mortgage there may be thirty three hundred dollars. So now you're like, uh, twenty five hundred, thirty three hundred. Uh, that's only, yeah, I can I can make I can make it work, but you're not even factoring all the expenses outside of buying a home, uh-huh. like all the maintenance and stuff. So in actuality, like that payment is actually like a a thousand dollar jump over over where you're at. So I always tell folks, in my opinion, the best way to go about finding a home is, is take like what you're paying for rent right now. So let's say you're paying $2,500 a month for rent and just work backwards in order to find out what that is for a home price. And just how you, how you do it real quick is, you can literally, literally just go into to Google and type in the word mortgage calculator. And so what'll pop up is a mortgage calculator. And what you wanna do is start putting in like loan amounts that'll get you a number that's like, it depends on your area, but that's like 60 to 70% of uh, 2,500. So let's say that's uh, 1,500, I think, if I'm doing that math. So you want to start just putting in loan amounts into the Google calculator until it spits out a principal and interest payment that's like $1,500. So next, and let's say that's a, um, let's say that's a $300,000 home. So next, what you want to do, or loan. So next, what you want to do is just go to, go to Zillow.com and start looking at $300,000 homes in your local where you want to find a home, right? And so you'll find a couple of things. You may find out there's no $300,000 homes in the neighborhood you want to live in. You may find out there are some homes, but they're not quite the home I want. Or you may be like, hey, this is something I can can work with. But as a reminder, like your first home should not be your dream home. So don't be too picky on that that Mm. first home. And then so you just go go to, uh, you just go down to the details and you'll find out what the tax history is is on that property. And so that's how you figure out what the taxes are. You want to look at a couple properties because they may be a property that has like some some exemptions and the tax are super low. But just take that number and now and divide by 12. So let's say um, the taxes are $4,800, right? You take $4,800 divided by 12, you got $400, $400, right? $400 a a month. So now you got your $1,500 $1,500 principal and interest payment, your $400 um, taxes. And now um, homeowner's insurance is a little bit tricky. I'll just say use what's in, in Zillow, but that's a quick way to, to work backwards from what's a comfortable payment for you and then formulate that into like a, a principal interest tax and insurance payment or a mortgage payment. So that's why I always advise folks to take that written number, work backwards to the home price because that's what you can actually afford. It may not be the home you like it may not be the home with the picket fence and the, and the pool and all that but that's that's the act that's the actual number you can afford like i said starting with the home price of mine you just I, i've seen a lot of folks just end up house poor because they 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 fall in love with the with the neighborhood and, and everything everything around it are you concerned about ai taking over all the jobs although ai can enhance software testing efficiency there are still in-demand careers that require human expertise like quality assurance QA engineers are crucial in defining testing strategies, identifying test cases, and managing testing environments. On that note, Careerist's manual QA course can equip you with the necessary knowledge, mentorship, and advice to become a QA specialist, regardless of your experience or college degree. As a licensed education provider, Careerist offers an interactive course that takes less than six months to complete and provides one-on-one guidance from personal mentors. Moreover, Careers has already helped over 1,000 graduates secure high-paying jobs in tech across 40 different states. And by using my link under this video, you can receive a discount on the course's cost. To get the 10% discount, follow the link in the description below of this video and fill out the application. Start your journey towards a successful tech career today. Yeah, that's very easy for it to happen. But I want you to talk about uh, 
because this is this is a phenomenon I see a lot, especially with people around my age that they're buying their first home. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You seeing people on the gram, you like, you know, people living it up, they living their life, people want to get their dream home. But like you just stated, buying your dream home for your first home necessarily isn't the best idea. Yeah. But talk about why that isn't a smart idea. Well, a couple of things, like life changes, right? Statistically, you're only going to be in the home for like like one, five to eight years to begin with. So you're, while you, you have this master plan of buying this dream home, you may not even be married or with a, you know, a guy or girl. Like life just changes in general, first and foremost. So the Thanks. idea that you're going to buy this home at 25 and then you're going to be on, on the rocking chair on the porch with your spouse at seven, that's just not, that's just not, not, not the, the truth. And then next, like, Buying your first home, if you buy it strategically, it's just a great way to buy your, is to build your real estate portfolio, right? Mm. I always say real estate is like a, a get rich slow scheme if you, if you do it right. Of course, there are folks that, you know, hey, I got 20, 50, 10, 100 doors, right? But for the most part, like you can just buy a home, live there for a year, move and, and do that every, every couple of years. And so when I'm looking at homes, and this is with, with hindsight based on my area of expertise, Look at a home as just having at least one good feature, whether that's like when I um, got a home in the DC area, I was like, I want a home that's going to be near Metro. Like that's the feature I want the home to have because I know in a year or two years when I go to rent that property, a home by a Metro is a very attractive feature. That's going to be something folks are always going to want versus you're just buying a home that you like, but it may just be a home that you like. It may not be it may not have the features that a, a renter wants. I always say buy a home from the perspective of a renter because that's most likely what's going to be able to get you to rent the property and just kind of build out that real estate portfolio. But yeah, the easiest way to buy your first home that's a you know, to build your portfolio, just buy your first home, put 3% down uh, conventional, 3.5% down FHA and just and, and just do that. No need to wait for that uh, home with a picket fence. Mm -hmm. you know? No, that's a bar. I mean, I never heard nobody say but buy, buy a home from the perspective of a renter. I never yeah. heard nobody say that. That's definitely a bar because like you said, the statistics tells you that long term you're not probably most likely not gonna be in that home anyway. Yeah. So you still gonna own it, you can rent it out and you yeah. can always generate money capital from this home. So that's that's you know, that's big. Mm -hmm. I hope that's not going over people's head. That's a big that's a big piece of advice right there, mm -hmm. man. But talk about so at this point, like uh you've been in well, real estate all like what, almost twenty yeah, since, since 2017, so I guess I'm knocking on knocking on seven seven years at this point. So seven years at this point. So, what like what are strategies like? Are you actively buying like uh, rental properties and stuff like that? So so right right now, the last property I bought was in, in 2019. Okay. So um like where I'm at right now is um I had three rental properties and a primary residence with my my wife right now, and so look looking at properties. But honestly, like the, as we were talking about before this, like the market is kind of kind of wild. You got, you got to wait for the, the right time to buy a property, especially if it's not, if you're looking at a rental property, you got to, got to run the numbers. So right, right now, just for, from my perspective, for the goals that I'm trying to establish with my, well, my wife and I is like, we're not looking to, to purchase any, any more like investment properties right now. You know, potentially if we find a deal, you're kind of always looking, but if we find like a deal deal, there's a potential that we may move from our, the residence right now and rent that out and buy another property. But for, for right now, just from, from our point of view, and yes, this is a realtor saying, hey, maybe you don't want to buy right now. It's that just from our point of view, it's just, it doesn't make sense for us, for the goals we have established. Because once again, I have a, a wife and a, a ni nice little little pup. If I was a, a single person, maybe I'd have some more leeway. Um, but uh, yeah, just for where I'm at in life right now, we're, we're not in the, um, in the point right now, we're looking at like investments and stuff, stuff like that. Speaking of, you, you, said, you said the right time. When, when do you think it will be the right time? So the the right time to buy for anybody is is always it depends. That's just the answer I give to anybody. Whether rates are seven and a half percent, whether rates are three percent, it really depends like what your your goals are. Like that's why I always say is focus on your goals, focus on your budget, and the rest will fall in place. So like right now, you know, I think as we speak, rates are like a little bit over 7%. Home prices are at all-time highs, but they hit all-time highs every single year. <laughs> um, and so a lot of folks are like, hey, should I wait to 2024, 2025 to buy a home? So I want to give folks a little bit of perspective on the market, right? Because I think a lot of folks are just kind of still stuck in this um, this COVID mindset, this 2 3% interest rate mindset. And hey, I'm waiting for rates to drop because 
you know, when the, I remember realtors on TikTok pointing at low rates and lenders doing all this on TikTok, uh, and they think two and three percent rates are, are normal. When I got to the entry in 2017 as a lender, a five percent rate was was perfectly perfectly normal. I think rates may have dipped down to like four um, percent at some point in 18 or 19. So if you are like, hey, and that's that's your prerogative, I wait waited for rates to go down. Make sure you're you have the proper perspective. Because if you're waiting for rates to hit two and three percent, that's never going to happen again, unless, unless there's another COVID or heaven forbid, there's like a you know we get into war or something like that. You know, not that there's anything going on right now that cause a, cause a war, but you know, right. but heaven forbid something like <laughs> something like something like something that, like that happens. But um, so here's here's what I think a lot of folks don't connect the dots on. Like why were rates so low in 2020, 2021, 2022? It's because the Federal Reserve moves the benchmark rate, the cost to borrow money. So typically it hovers around like two, two and a half percent. And so the benchmark rate is basically the cost for banks and lenders to borrow money. So when COVID hit, folks didn't know what was going on. They lowered that benchmark rate down to like 0.25%, from like two and a half percent down to 0.25% to stimulate the economy. Rates were so low, folks were spending money. It kind of did its thing. And that, that's why real estate prices, you know, went up at like a literally a 43% clip from like 2020 to 2021. Folks are spending, this caused inflation. Now, p- part of inflation too was just companies raising prices. I think we all know that and hide behind inflation with, with the price, but that, that caused in inflation. So in June of 2022, inflation peaked at, I think, 9.1%. So, you know, the, the Fed is like, okay, or... Congress is like, oh, we need to get inflation under control. So Congress gave the mandate to the Federal Reserve to get inflation down to 2%, from 9.1% to 2%. So now that's why you've seen rates go up so dramatically. You hear about all these rate hikes because the Federal Reserve is trying to uh, get inflation down to, to 2%. So that's why, like, from June 2022, they raised the cost of borrow money or the benchmark rate like 11 straight times. And that's why rates are like in the 7 eight percent threshold because of that so now as inflation gets under control the federal reserve hopefully like in 2024 may lower the cost to borrow money so they they meet almost every month but i think from what i've seen there may be like one or two rate cuts in in 2024 and i say all that to say is don't wait on two percent rates three percent rates four percent rates from everything i've seen like rates are most likely just going to be in the sixes to throughout 2024. So if your thing is like, hey, I'm waiting for rates to drop, your prerogative, but don't wait till they hit the twos and threes and fours. That that's not happening probably for another like two three years. So yeah, you, like you said though, everybody kind of we you know got used to those COVID rates. And yeah, yeah. We, we thought that was the new norm, the yeah, new reality. Yeah. Well, well, it wasn't. <laughs> but let me let me ask you this: Have anybody ever told you something like Barack Obama? I, I, I have I've got that a little bit. I get that sometimes. I get the uh, <laughs> I look like um, uh, you know who Bernie Williams is on the Yankees. Uh-uh. Oh, go, for, go, Google that after the episode. Okay. You, you'll have a, you'll have a chuckle. So I, I, yeah, I get I get that. I get that as I get that as well. One of the one of the one of the Yankees players. I ain't gonna say his name because I ain't gonna put his business out there. But I know him. We, we used to li- we used to live in the same building. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's he's a uh, he's a real he's a well. This this is completely off topic. But baseball <laughs> players they are so like. Um, they so normal looking, uh-huh. so it's, so it's it's not like a professional basketball player or a football player where you see him. Yeah, LeBron walking the door. You, you know, know you like, know who that. or even the the twelve man walking the door. You exactly. Know, you, you know who that is. Yeah. You like you do something like yeah, you, yeah. Well, who are you? But a baseball player. I remember we were sitting we were sitting down at the bar at my building, and we was already chatting for an hour. We talking for an hour just about life and about regular stuff. And then towards like the last the, the hour, he's like, "Yo, bro, did you did you know who I was?" Uh-huh. And I was like brother i don't know who the hell you are right now i'm like who are, you must be somebody for you to say that i'm like who are you so he told me who he was i'm like oh shit he showed me his instagram and all that i'm uh-huh. like oh shit he really he's a professional baseball player he's actually really good too uh-huh. and he was he was really good people but that was just i don't know why there's just a sign of the pop in my head but I also i want to talk about this let me ask you this do you feel like as a military vet do you feel like because I, I got my own opinions on this do you feel like the military was a cheat code for you yeah, I, I definitely do, because cause one, to be honest with you, like your first, I don't know, man, first five, two years of life, post-college, post-high school, you don't know what you're doing. You have no idea what you're <laughs> yeah, doing. Yeah, just, you're just, and then, you know, you got folks getting into to student loan debt, because it's like, oh, I need to go to college, because, 
I don't really know what I want to do. Like your first two years of college, you don't know what you're doing. And so hopefully you decide on a, on a major. But yeah, the military, the military definitely was. So like I, I went to the U.S. Naval Academy. So the thank you, the American taxpayer. They paid for Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, they paid, they paid for my, my college. So um, one, when I, got, when I graduated college, I had no, I had no debt at all. And, and another thing, is, I'll tell you this, most folks don't know this either. So at, at least at the U.S. Naval Academy, what they do is your uh, your junior year, they'll give you because the banks want to hook you in because they know hey this person's going to have a job for at least five years. Exact guaranteed income. So they give you this loan. They give you a twenty. You can take up to a twenty five thousand dollar loan, but they give it to you at like point zero. It's almost what? free money. It's like point zero. I'm probably saying the number two, but it's like what? point zero. It's like point zero five this. interest, and so. Um, Damn, I should have been an officer. Yeah, yeah, because they because they want they want to hook you in. So I've been with I've been with my bank ever since they gave me that they gave me that loan. And so um, that's actually what helped me buy my my first property. At, that's at, crazy. At, at twenty was was a little bit of money from that from that what? that loan. But uh, yeah, you you you're not going to know what you're doing for the first five years of life. I was and I know the military ain't for everybody, but it just like right. learn some life skills, meet meet some folks, and learn some life lessons, and then. Once you're ready to hit the world, like um, at least you don't have student loan debt. That's, that's the end. yeah. So you you meet you meet folks, man. It's 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 good. Le- One of the most important lessons I think I learned in the military is that it's just it's just to take take action, right? And so um, and I remember one of my my good friends. I was talking to them. And he was like, "Hey, um, I remember I can't even remember the question I was asking, but I was like, "Hey, are you ready for X, Y, and Z?" And he was like. Ready or not, it's coming. So you, you might you might as well you might as well get ready because I think a lot of folks don't realize that like no decision is, is a, decision. a decision. It's a decision to say exactly where you are. It's better to make a bad decision quick, get the information from the bad decision, recalibrate, assess, and do something else than to, to sit there for forever and then now you made the bad decision, but you don't even got time to recover from that from that bad decision. But yeah, the, the military was definitely um, for many reasons financially. Mentally, um, I'm here in Dallas because of a, yeah. a guy I know from the from the Navy, but definitely like a a, a head start in life. So I'm I'm, I'm kind of smirking and laughing a little bit because that answer that was 100 percent a military answer. I can tell you, <laughs> I, can, I can tell you a vet based on that. I can talk to people and based on how they what they saying. I'm like, oh, that's a vet. Uh-huh. But bro, I I I can't I can't repeat that better than what you just said. Like I'm uh-huh. on the how I feel about it is, and I tell all younger people, especially like early 20s, late teens. I'm like, dude, if you go in the military, because I feel like I can show anybody, if you join in the military right now, I can show you, if you listen step by step by the, if you listen to step by step what I tell you, by the time you're 40, you could be a millionaire. Like, just being in the military. It's not going to be something overnight where I'm 25 a millionaire. It's going to yeah. take time, obviously, but st- 40 is extremely young, man. Like you said, the thing with no debt, paying for your school, getting job experience, traveling yeah. the world while getting paid, and then you could get out within four to six, 10 years. Yeah. And if you do the right steps, do everything you post, you could be pretty much set for life, man. Yeah. I tell, I, I preach this to everybody. And like you said, yeah. it's, the military isn't for everybody. But if you somebody that's thinking about it, that think you could do it, especially when you got that youthful av- advantage, yeah. that you're 19, 20, 21, you still got most, so, so much time ahead of you. Oh man, like, let me ask you this. What do you think, what do you think is better? I just, I just asked somebody else this. All right. A military vet, a military vet with all his benefits, or a college degree. Military vet with all his benefits or college degree. So it. So my answer a lot is is it depends. It depends what your degree is in. Is in. Right. So I mean, if you're um, an aerospace engineer or you got some sort of engineering <laughs> degree or something like that, or computer, some sort of some sort of degree that's going to result in a high paying job. Yeah, definitely. But if you're just a like most folks. You're going to college and you're just figuring it out as you go. And it's just like, uh, let me get a degree in business, I don't, business or let me get a degree in uh, econ. Or, you don't really know. It's just I need to put something on this line. I'm a junior. I got to figure this out. I think that's how most people are. It's like you might as well be that that military vet with the benefits. You got, you know, your uh, GI Bill, which yeah. if you work backwards, you, you get to go to college for free. If you go in as enlisted, you got your VA benefits, zero percent down to to get a loan. At Home Depot, you get to park in, in the front. At, uh, <laughs> <laughs> at Home Depot, I mean, like, yeah, I, I would say it really, it really depends. But um, like I said, the military ain't for everybody. But if it's you, not. if you don't know what you want to do, I would strongly 
consider it. Just yeah. due to all the benefits. Just it's it's five years. Five years of your life. You'll get out. You'll be 22, 21, 22, and um, at least in the same position as the folks you know that that graduated from from college, but with no, no at, student loans. So. At the minimum, too, probably. Yeah, yeah. Because how old were you when you got out? I was uh, 20, 25. You was 25. Yeah. And as you said, everybody that's listening, you was 25 with $100,000 yeah, yeah. net worth. Yeah, 106000 100, And I, it's funny, I remember that number specifically. It was like uh, 106000 because when I got out of the, uh, the military, this is the first time I ever met my financial advisor in person. And so I was meeting with him. I was, <laughs> and I, I was like, because I've just been just putting money into to an account and all, and all that. I'll say, boys and girls, watch out for uh, advisor fees. But um, I've just been Man. putting money into auto deposit into an account for like five years. And um, I, I'm, I'm very few, very frugal. And so every anytime I, um, my bank account, my checking account started to get bigger, I would just increase the, the, the deposits. Best. Like I, I, didn't, I didn't change my living habits one bit over those, those five years, even though in military you get those, you get those pay increases. But I remember sitting down with them and I was like, um, am I doing, am I doing okay right now? I, I had no clue. I was like, am I doing okay? And I remember he laughed at me, but like a good laugh. He was like, yeah, you're doing okay, buddy. You're doing better than probably 95% of my, of my clients. And that's something that I never really, 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 really thought about. But, uh, yeah, join, join, join yeah. the military. I, no, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, bro, I had a similar experience right before, um, uh, me and my wife got out. We had a very similar experience. We had, we went to go see one of the financial advisors mm -hmm. just to see like, is there anything that we're not doing that we could be doing or mm -hmm. is there anything that we're doing wrong it was our first meeting he was an older guy he's probably like in his 70s and we went to his office and we sat down and he's like going over our financials and all that and mm -hmm. stuff and he's just like he's quiet i could just tell he's just reading and it's like 10 minutes he's just not saying anything mm -hmm. so i'm asking questions and advice and he's like dude just <laughs> keep doing what y'all doing yeah, he didn't yeah. really give me like and he was just like keep doing what you're doing like y'all yeah. are like well on your way and at this time I think I'm 25, it's the same age, 25 uh -huh. years old. So, and not, and this this sounds like a damn military ad or something. <laughs> but we're just yeah, talking yeah. about, you know, we speaking vet to vet, talking about our yeah, experiences yeah. and how beneficial it can be just for the people that may be sitting at home pondering and thinking, like, is that something I can do? Because the internet, everybody on the internet, the internet will gas you up to yeah. think, like, you're going to do this, you're going to get on the journey with entrepreneurship when you're 18, 19, yeah. you're going to become a millionaire by 25. Yeah, but I will say one thing about the military. You probably heard this, like, choose your rate, choose your fate. There are some there are some rates and billets you pick where you will be in the in the dirt, in the sand, doing stuff, but you, you can be yeah. you can be a cook. You yeah. can be like a, a mechanic and learn a, a skill set there. So um, That's true. Like, so just do something. Like, <laughs> That's true. Hey, like, this is endorsed true. by the U.S. Army. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we sound like we, we have, this is not a paid advertisement. This is not an ad. We're just thinking. But that's a good point. <laughs> that, anybody will tell you that. Like, yeah. you just make sure if you're thinking about that, make sure you're doing something yeah. that yeah. you can see yourself doing. If your recruiter's like, hey, don't worry about your designation. You're going to be in the oh, you're man. Gonna be in the dirt and the mud. So. And, a, and, a, and why not somewhere in the negative 20 degree weather or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me... Uh, um, get regarding real estate let me let me ask you this so for someone that's listening and watching right and uh it's a lot of people that's considering buying their first home that they might be around 30 younger than 30 what would you say is the main things like that they need to look out for for regarding i'm speaking to people that make probably not great money but not bad so just like pretty much pretty much average income uh -huh. what would you say there are the main things they need to look out for during this process so I'm going to run you through this, this quick eight-step process, as quick quick as I can. Okay. So step, step one, I always tell folks, just believe. As corny as it sounds, if you don't think you can buy a home, you're, you're, you're right, right? So, um, but also, if you do think you buy a home, that doesn't mean you're right. you got to put together a plan. So as I, as I mentioned, like, the second step was making sure you're setting your goals. Because like I said, the internet will tell you, you got to buy you got to buy a four-unit property, house at, kick your feet up, and all that. The people... 90% of people saying that have never purchased a multifamily property in, in their life. That's why they just think real estate is buy a multifamily property, kick your feet up. But establish your goals. Like, do you want to do, do you want to buy a multifamily property? Are you truly ready to be a landlord? Are you ready at 25, 30, 20 to tell a 40-year-old man that's later in their rent, well, can you pay the rent? Like, are you are you actually ready to do that? Like, being a landlord isn't as easy as you, you think it is. So set up a plan. Maybe you want to buy a single family property, live there for a year, move. Maybe you want to get the condo. Like establish like your actual goals and your plan is, is, is step number two. Like step number three is literally actually establish an actual budget 
an Excel spreadsheet, put numbers on there, and see what you got left over um, at the end to make sure you're picking that, that home price correctly. Then uh, step number four is actually figuring out how long it will take you to purchase this home. Let's say you have zero in your bank account right now. It's gonna cost you, let's say $24,000 to buy this home. You need, if you have a budget and a spreadsheet, you'll see that, hey, every month I have like $1,000 left over. So it's like, well, man, that's gonna take me 24 months to buy the home. So now you decide, maybe I wanna look at a cheaper home, maybe I wanna pick up, run some DoorDash, pick up a side hustle. Now you at least know that, hey, I have a plan in order to, in order to work towards this, this down payment and purchasing the home and figuring out like what the down payment is for various properties. So if you don't know it, US, USDA, VA, NACA, 0%. Um, conventional 3%, FHA 5.5%. That, that's how you figure out like your down payment for uh, the properties. And one one perk of the FHA loan is you can buy up to four units with a 3.5% down payment. But recently the guidelines changed for multi for conventional loans that now you can put down starting November, I don't know what day of the week it is, starting November 18th, you can actually that's put down up. putting down only 5% to buy a multifamily property with a conventional loan, which is a, a, a huge uh, you know, game changer as, as the folks say. But making sure you know what those goals are so you can figure out the down payment. Next is figuring out like what your closing costs are gonna be. So a lot of times I see this bogus advice online where folks like say between two and 7% of the sales price for a down payment. And I always say that's, that's horrible advice because there's an actual number here. Like here in the Dallas market, it's about your closing costs are gonna be about three and a half percent of the sales price. But if you if you save between two and seven percent, you're buying a four hundred thousand dollar home. Is it is it eight thousand or is it is it what twenty eight thousand dollars? Right? Like you need to figure out what that number is in order to actually establish your, your your budget. So figuring out what those those closing costs are there. Next, so you, you've done all you've done all this kind of kind of work to figure out at least the financial part. I always say next is just kind of I would say it's like the wolf side. You want to step back and say, okay, am I actually ready to buy a home? Like from a mental standpoint, like okay, I'm I'm here. Uh, I have I have the finances in order, but is my job stable? Mm. Am I ready to do this? Have I talked to my my loved one about it? You know, maybe she wants to move back to Seattle. Have we even had this conversation about me purchasing a home with like my significant other? And then like after you do all that, so we haven't even talked about a realtor or a lender yet. Like all this stuff, you, you want to make do this self realization before you get influenced by any sort of real estate professional. Next, now finally you want to talk to a lender to figure out like, okay, I had this great plan about what I wanted to do. Now can I actually qualify for it? Because I think where a lot of people get twisted is your lender will tell you what you can qualify for, not afford what you can qualify for. So people sometimes conflate those two. It's like, oh, the lender said I can qualify for $500,000, but you're gonna be, you may only be able to afford $4,000. It's not the lender's job. They'll look at your debts and DTI and probably be like, it's going to be tough sled for this person, but it's not their job to tell you that, hey, you can't afford this. Can't afford yeah, it. so they're not going to do that. And then finally, when that's all said and done, you, you, you've you um, got qualified. Say so, hey, now finally you want to sit down and like talk to talk to a realtor after after all that. So I think people talk to a realtor like way, way, way too early in, in the process. So I would say go through that that process. And lastly, like. Don't be afraid to get your, your credit pool. Like there's this whole <laughs> myth about like, I would call like big credit who put, put out all this bogus information about inquiries and all this stuff ruining your credit. In, in the history of applying for a home loan, not a single person has ever been denied a mortgage because they had too many credit, they had too many inquiries. That, that's just not a thing. It's just some bogus thing that credit repair people tell you in order mm. to, to so, so that, cause they're easy to remove, but don't be afraid of credit increase at all. So. Mm, you know, yeah. I like, that's that's some valuable advice, man. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And something that you spoke on in regard, like ready to be in a landlord and how challenging it is. Like, I love that message, bro, because we know the narrative online and, it, and, and it's good. There's positive. Like, I love that. And like, and I did something that I've done on my platform. We are um, convincing and encouraging people, I'll, I'll say, to start investing in real estate, yeah. buying properties. But sometimes that narrative especially when you see online is all people saying buy property just buy just whatever you just go <laughs> yeah, buy real estate yeah, yeah. and it's like you're not telling their listeners and everybody that's watching like what they can go through after they buy a property like the, yeah. the stuff that you may have to deal with with tenants with tenants not paying with tenants mm -hmm. just being dickheads with like all <laughs> all kinds of stuff exactly, that can happen exactly, that exactly. you have to mentally prepare for because it can get really crazy man what yeah. do you do when the tenant 
ain't paid you rent in six months and you yeah. in the, and you are in a um, tenant friendly state. Like, what do you do in those situations? And that's something that everybody yeah, not need to really, consider that. Like, yeah. I seen Cardi B talking about. Like, <laughs> yeah. Did you see that? Yeah, that's yeah, what you're she, talking about. Yeah, she's yeah. talking about like how everybody's saying about real estate, and she was like, "This shit is this shit is a lot. Like, it's a lot to this, yeah. and it's not as simple as easy as me people try to put it online. But it is worth it. It most definitely with most the right definitely. deals, it's definitely worth it. But mm -hmm. my point I'm getting at is whoever decides to get into this industry. Don't just go out and buy anything just because the, the message online is go buy real estate. Yeah, and I think also, like, you have to be willing to to wait. That's what I tell folks. The easiest way to buy your first investment property is just to is to buy a property that works for you from the perspective of a renter and then just just, just, just wait. Let, let time pass. Because, like, I'll, I'll see all these stats where it's going to be like, hey, in, in the top 40 metros, now it's cheaper to rent a home than it is to buy. To buy. Which is true, but I always say... Who, who cares? Because the real question is, is it cheaper to rent today than it would be if you had purchased that home five years ago? Like that that's the real question you need to ask. Is it cheaper to rent, is it cheaper to own today than it will be to rent that home in, in five, five years. years? It's weird, like real estate is one of those things that people always want immediate gains from. It's like, no, you just like just like investing. Well, you you have you buy an uh, index fund or something like that, you 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 buy Apple stock, you don't expect to buy a stock on Monday. And then on Wednesday, you you kick your feet up like Scrooge McDuck. Like there, like time has to pass when you're investing in any asset class. And so I like to tell folks, um, like we're, we're talking at the beginning about my uh, my grandma bought a home in DC in in nineteen like nineteen seventy, right? So sometime during that time frame. And so I always hear folks they talk about like generational wealth. Like that's that's the that's the big catchphrase. But folks rarely talk about like the generational actions and generational knowledge. So, like my grandmother bought this home in DC around, around 1970. I'm not, not even sure what she, she paid for. At a certain point in time, like she could not, uh, she retired, fixed income, can, could, couldn't afford the property anymore. And so generational action number one was her, her buying the property. Generational action number two was my, her daughter, my mother purchased the property for her or had put her name on the deed so she could stay in the property. And so it, it worked out right because my grandmother got to stay in the property. Um, they got to own the property. And like one thing I think outside of all the financial things with, with owning real estate is like owning is the difference between like having to live, living where you want to live and living where you have to live. Like when you, when you rent, folks can say, hey, the lease is up, time to move. When you own, you are, you are there. Like I mean, property taxes can go up, but when you own, you are there, you have the choice to sell or not. And so like my first recollection of this property was like in, in like the 19, 1990s. It was like such, such a long time saying 1990s, right? But I remember walking down the street as a, as a kid and it wasn't like, the, it wasn't like the, it wasn't a bad neighborhood, but it wasn't like the best neighborhood. You would, there's some like some unsavory activities I say going on on the, on the streets. But then I remember when I got out the military, like late 2010s, I remember, I remember driving back to go see my grandmother. And it's funny the things you remember as a kid, but the last memory of that area is I remember going the other way down the street at night and there was somebody probably unfortunately like lost their life because I remember like the, the, the police lights and the, and the yellow tape. And then, then probably 15 years later, I'm coming the other direction. Like my dad's driving, my sister's in the passenger seat. I'm in, I'm in the seat in the back and I'm looking down the same block and I'm like, wow, the block has really, really changed. I remember seeing like a, this, this shop, like Witch Witch, like the sandwich shop. And I was like, oh, it's pretty cool. They got a nice sandwich shop. Man, Witch Witch, you know it's a good, it's a decent <laughs> yeah. area. You can see a Witch yeah. Witch. And so like we were at the, so we stopped at the stoplight. So we're, we're hitting, and so we stopped at the stoplight and my grandmother's house is, is left right down the street. And so we're stopping there and I just, I look through the front window of the car and I look and I see there's a Whole Foods on this corner. And this is in, in downtown DC. So I'm like, there used to be like this old, there used to be a corner store right there when I last remember um, looking at this property. Now there's a, a Whole Foods. And so we go down the, the rest of the street, man. And like now it's, it's the good graffiti. They got murals on the wall and all and all <laughs> and all this stuff. Just because like my my grandmother made the, made the took the general action to buy the home. My parents general action to keep the, the property in the family by having my grandmother stay there. And now like right now, unfortunately, my grandmother has, has passed. But now right now, my my sister is in the process of like renovating, renovating their property. So we think real estate, like you, there, there are folks that have like the 10, 20 doors, but real estate, buy a home and sometimes just wait. Like you gotta have like generational wealth in like, in like a week, like folks want generational no. wealth in a week, but you gotta sometimes wait a generation or you gotta take actions in order to like build wealth for, for the family. But that I've never looked it up because I think it'll be corny, but that 
their property is probably worth close to a quarter million, a million dollars. Uh, it's yeah. a, it's a, I mean, it's a townhome in like downtown DC on the, like on the same block as a, uh, a Whole Foods. So. Damn. Yeah, yeah. No, that's 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 heavy, bro. And mm -hmm. the gener the the generational wealth conversation is always so interesting to me because everybody speaks on it, but it's like, how many of y'all really studying wealth that's been built for generations? Because exactly. if you understand generational wealth, you'll know that the most gener most wealthy families lose their wealth within one to two generations. Yeah. They got the saying: the first generation builds it, the yeah. second generation enjoys it. The third generation destroys it for a reason. Yeah, like I think our issue is that when I'm talking about us, the, the, the black community, is that you know we're 400 years behind, so we feel like we got to get it all in, in one 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 fell swoop. It's mm -hmm. so like you, you talk about like uh, your your friend, the baseball player. In, in, in baseball, it's easier to score a run if you got a runner on first and third mm. than if you got nobody on mm. base. So really, what we need to be working on working working on focusing on is just getting on base. Like it, it is great to be the you know, you can be, uh, you know, Jay Z, or LeBron James. You can, you can. Some people can can be a billionaire in one generation, but even if you look at like Robert Smith, the uh, you know the wealthiest black man in America, he's a fourth generation college graduate. Now, college is not the the um, end all be all. It's a but huge. As a yeah, as a black man to be a fourth generation college graduate in this country means that he has some parents that that got on base, established things. Then when he got to bat, he he he, he knocked it out of the park. But I think. We need to focus on like getting on base, but we're trying to we're 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 trying to swing for the fences every single time. But what happens is we never get anywhere, or we we get on Damn. base and we're doing we're doing risky stuff, and then you know getting up this baseball now you're getting picked off from first base now now you're back to zero. But just like focus on getting on base, like um, and so that maybe your 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 kid has an has an easier opportunity going forward. But uh, yeah, we just want to. Every time we at bat, we got to go gotta, for a grand home run. Yeah, we got we got we got to run the play. We got to do all this stuff. Just Damn. just just focus on the the basics. It's not it's not sexy, but the basics will help build generation wealth. If you think about a generation, not just not just you know your um not just what's happening in your your lifetime. So yo, yeah. that's a hell of a that's the best analogy. When it comes to the generational wealth conversation, I've been had plenty of conversations about this. That's hands down the best analogy I've ever heard about that. I appreciate it. No, seriously, bro, <laughs> because that is like so many, like you said, we talk about generational wealth all the time, but at the end of the day, we're not taking those generational actions because we taking crazy risks and we not, yeah. we just trying to hit a home run, grand slam up to, as far as, I'll take that back. We're trying to hit a grand slam instead of just trying to get on base yeah. first, get to second so base. I, I, and I'll tell you this, one of the biggest advantages I think I've had in life is so since I graduated college, my parents have not given me a single penny. But I know deep down inside that if I call my parents on, let's say, January 31st at, I don't know, 4 p.m., like, you know, an hour before the, the wire closed, and it was like, hey, man, I messed up. I can't pay the mortgage this month. I, I, I'm 99% sure my parents would be able to cover it with, with an hour's notice. And so, like, I'm able to maneuver like like that and take risky and make riskier plays and do things like that because i know deep down inside like if if everything was to come crashing down i i know i have a safety net and so i think that that's another advantage is like when when i talk about getting on base just 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 being being like a safety net for for like your kids so they don't have to worry about taking care of you they don't have to worry about anything you're doing they can start building on you know building on on their own so i think being able to take like those 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 risks because you are the safety net for your kid is something that I think folks you know overlook as well. We look at like the the wealthiest people um, around, like Bill Gates, wealthy parents, Elon Musk, you know, wealthy, wealthy parents. parents. Like it's 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 very rare. Like uh, like I said, in our community, we, we hold up the Jay Zs and Lebrons and stuff and stuff like that. And like Damon John, if I were to name like a, an actual like um, just straight business guy, but it's, mm -hmm. it's very rare that you're going to build like generational wealth. In, in one, one generation, generation wrestling, you know, you know, get it out the mud like everybody likes to like to talk about. So. No, that, bro, that's I'm so glad you said that because mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful message for everybody to hear mm -hmm. and keep in mind. So and that also alleviates so much pressure on people because society, social media is putting so much pressure on a lot of people. Where they feel like if I ain't got generational wealth by the time I'm gone, I didn't fail that life. I've been miserable yeah. when that's yeah. really not the case. So I'm so happy yeah. that you really said that. And, and this is this is the final thing I got for you before we wrap up. So for everybody that's that's listening and watching, right? And that what are some words of wisdom, some words of advice that you could give them and where they may be feeling in a place where it's like, 
I want to buy a home, but that's just not realistic for me because I don't make enough money. I don't got the good job. I feel like I could never get there. Like, what's that piece of advice you would say to them to uplift them and get them on the right track? Yeah, so just staying on the generational wealth note is sometimes you may not be able to get there. But once again, if we're thinking long term, put your your kids in a position to at least pick up where you where you left off. Also, like I said, your first home should not be your dream home. Sorry, excuse me. Your first home should not, should not be your dream home. So sometimes it may be in, in a position where you may not be able to buy a home in the, in the most desirable neighborhood. But we always talk about, you know, gentrification, gentrification, gentrification. Well, what's gentrification? Gentrification is somebody buying a home in a neighborhood that's undervalued, then bringing value to the neighborhood. Sometimes it's just their, their race brings value to the neighborhood, if we're being honest. Mm-hmm. But bringing value to that neighborhood and now prices blow up. So in your community, there's there's probably an area that, and I'm not saying put, put safety at risk, but there's probably an area right now where it's, it may not be the best, but maybe that's where you, you got to start. Like everyone like has to start somewhere. So I'll say that everyone has to start somewhere because real estate, it, it, it's always going to be here. It's going to be here, you know, a hundred years from now. Folks will always need a place to say like, folks always say like, uh, I left, folks are like prostitution is the world's oldest profession. But I like to point out to folks that the prostitutes had to get rent a room from somebody, right? <laughs> they, they had to rent that cave. They had to they rent went that on hut. The street. They, they, they had to rent that room from somebody, right? So <laughs> real estate has always e- existed. So I would say just um, start start somewhere. It may not be the the dream home, but just just start and at least at least build that building block for your for your for your kid. And so um yeah, just 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 start and do something. But more importantly, put together a plan. Like just being frustrated because rates are high. Home prices are high. You have a right to be frustrated, but if you don't have a plan, like the only person you got to be mad at is yourself. And when it's all said and done, if you know, um, when it's all said and done, if you aren't, I don't know. I'll just leave it at that. If you, well, I'll just leave it. At that. I don't want to talk about folks and what they do with their <laughs> But when it's all said and done, make sure you have some sort of plan and you can't be your best shot. I'll just, I'll just leave it. Just leave it. I'll just leave it. I'm about to say something that folks might get up, you know, get upset. So no, yeah. that's that's wonderful advice, yeah. bro. Like planning is planning is everything. That's the first step. You can't do nothing without a plan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's that's. That's um, improvement development one on one. You get a plan. Yeah. What is a notepad? Get on notes on your phone. Yeah. You, are, you got Chat GPT these days. Exactly. Create me exactly, a plan for exactly. blah, 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 yeah. blah. And I, I, was, I would say this. Like I said, if you want to, um, I would say uh, if you need help putting out a plan, like reach out to me. Like I literally have an actual plan. You can check out, you know, my my um, uh, the Instagram. You can check out my my podcast as well. But I have I have actual actionable steps I like to give folks. I don't just kind of like a. Uh, um, bloviate on online, but I got some actual actionable steps to help you, you just, formulate a plan. So. You just segued me right into it, bro. So mm-hmm. I was gonna let the, I was gonna ask you to plug in all your stuff where people can find you, follow you if they want to uh, buy a home and go through the process with you, whatever it is. Yeah, so I'd say first and foremost, like if you're looking to to per, understand how to purchase a home, I would say you can check out my my podcast. It's House Rich, the first time homebuyer show. I would say start with episode if you don't. Episode 109, I lay out like the basic, it's called like the home buying manifesto. I just lay out the basic steps on, on how to buy homes. So I would say check that out. If you're watching on YouTube, check out my um, YouTube channel by the same uh, name. There's like a playlist, 2023 home buying playlist. Uh, check that out. Uh, if you want to connect with me, I'm here in the in the Dallas market, but I can actually help you in any market with my network. You can find me on Instagram at House Rich Dave. Um, just, you know, they say, click the link in the bar. You can schedule, schedule a call. I typically say, um, unless you're in the Dallas area, you can't schedule a call, but if you just tell me you heard me in the podcast, you can you can schedule a call with me no matter uh, where you are on, in the whole my process. But uh, start, start, start is my um, start. my my words of uh, wisdom or advice. So. Thank you, bro, and I love that name, House of Rich Dave, because that's a beautiful thing. Because today, you know, keeping up with the Jones, there's so many people that is house poor, nice home, but barely can that, afford that, to. That's literally why I chose the name because everyone talks about being house poor, but if you plan correctly, house rich is what is what you can be. So mm, that's a beautiful thing, bro. And mm-hmm. wrapping up, I want to say, bro, I appreciate you taking the time to come out on the show. This was an amazing conversation. I really loved it, and I know my listeners, the viewers, and even me, I got a lot of value from having this conversation. So I really appreciate I you. Pre- coming appreciate on the you show, too. Bro. Appreciate the time. And I, like I said, I love love the show. So yeah, thank you doing your thing as well. Thank so. you, bro. Thank you. And then wrapping up, you guys can find me on all platforms. I'm at the official Xavier Miller, and I have the Millionaire Mindsets pl- pl- podcast available everywhere. That's YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can find us on every single platform. And that's all I have for you guys on this episode of Millionaire Mindsets podcast. See you guys next episode.
Peace. You gotta get your brain right if you're trying to make a million dollars. If you ain't gonna do it for yourself, then do it for your mama. Only stay surrounded by them people. If you know they solid, elevate your hustle up today to double up your profit. Trying to learn some game, Xavier, y'all gonna talk about it. No, Deanna, speak that shit that everybody vouches. Ain't no more excuses valid. Get up off the couch and get up in your bag. To your bank account, need an accountant.